Okay, please take your seats. We're going to get going. A couple of announcements. Um, the first thing I want to do is to thank our sponsors, Atrex, Allard, Gene DX, and Dynamic Bracing Solutions. And thank, I want to thank them for sponsoring this conference. I also want to make sure that you uh, go see Jonah Berger, who's written a book. He's out there. He's an author. He's a motivational speaker. You'll be hearing him at, uh, in Palo Alto area. Um, Sarah Kesti, who is uh, both Jonah and Sarah are on the CMTA's advisory board. And my friend Patrick Major, who is also in my uh, support group at the, in San Francisco. And Patrick, are you here? Pat Patrick's not you. <laughs> Patrick. Patrick has a wonderful story. Grab one of his DVDs. He's been featured on Animal Planet, and um, he's just a very inspirational and, uh, person and great guy. So next are on, on our... Oh, so for the youth outing. Everybody that's going on the youth outing, please meet out in the lobby with Johan and Jonah at 3 p.m., and they will be leaving from there, and they will be back at 9 o'clock. Okay? So next on our agenda is Bethany Malash. Bethany, I've known her for the last several years. We've become very close. Uh, she stuck with me, and I'm stuck with her, I think. Bethany is the CMTA's director of social media. She has done a fabulous job with our um, social media, the Facebook, the Twitter, the LinkedIn. She's also a very hard worker. She's a student at Berkeley, and she's just finishing up her studies now. And I also find Bethany to be extremely motivational and inspirational, as you'll hear in her talk, introducing my friend Bethany Malash. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that nice introduction. It is such a pleasure to be here speaking to all of you. I remember my first CMTA conference. It was in Detroit, and I was 15 years old. And I was a little apprehensive. This was the first time meeting a bunch of other people with my disease, and I didn't really know to what to expect. When I first walked into that conference room, I spotted a man walking past me. And he was a sort of normal-looking, nondescript man by most accounts, but he had what I recognized as a very classic CMT walk. You know, the one where your legs are going up a little bit too high. And I just stood there staring at him. It was a wonderful walk. It was a beautiful walk because it was mine. And in that moment, I realized that, hey, these are my people. You are my people. The thing I love most about CMT conferences is not the meetings, although we get to hear from the world's most prominent CMT researchers and specialists. You guys rock, by the way. But it's the moments between the meetings, and it's the moments after the meetings, when it inevitably devolves into us all sitting around and discussing the shared oddities of our lives. And you know the ones that I'm talking about, the ones that only our people can understand. Like, what is up with Ziploc bags? Right? What sick and depraved mind ever thought that these were a good idea? I'd like to meet him. And you know what? It's kind of nice to be with people who at one point in their life have worried about being picked up by a police officer, knowing that they can't possibly pass a sobriety check, even if you haven't had a drink in years. If I'm supposed to put my finger on my nose and my arm out and my legs together, I'm going down. <laughs> and don't even get me started on trying to walk a straight line. I have CMT, and at least here we know that we are in this together. I didn't always know that I had CMT. Uh, it eluded me and even my parents for several years. This is me when I was seven playing karate, karate. <laughs> but by the time I was 12, it became obvious that something was seriously wrong. And a neurologist basically had to glance at me before diagnosing me with CMT type 1A. Most kids 
stop wanting to go trick-or-treating because they start feeling too mature, too old. I stopped going because I could no longer climb the couple of steps up to my neighbor's porches. In school, as my abilities decreased, I found myself turning down invitations to hang out with my peers at their houses or go to parties because I was so scared that I would have to face stairs and that my classmates might realize how different from them I was rapidly becoming. That all fell apart my sophomore year of high school. This was going to be a really big year for me, and I was excited because I don't know if you've ever seen those ch cheesy high school movies where you have the girl and she's sort of a loner and no one realizes how awesome she is, and then she has this moment at the prom or, you know, with the play, and they realize, wow, she's really great. We love her, and now she's the star of the movie. Well, I was going to have one of those moments, okay? I had been selected to sing the lead solo in the school musical. This was going to be my moment. This is how my classmates would see me. They wouldn't see my disability. They would see me for someone who was one of them and for who could be included in their lives. A week before the play, I was at school with my peers rehearsing and helping to paint the backdrop. Suddenly, while painting, I felt my leg seize up. I tried not to act like anything was wrong because I wouldn't want my peers to realize that I had CMT. But as I tried to shake it out, I fell backwards hard onto my butt. Instant humiliation. And the humiliation got worse once I realized that not only had I dislocated my kneecap during the fall, but I had knocked over at least three gallons of paint. And now I'm laying there injured, broken, no ego left, swimming in blue and yellow paint. As I saw it, my moment was over. My classmates were not going to remember me for my great song in the school play. They were going to remember the girl who fell in three gallons of paint. And I remember their faces as they watched me being wheeled out to the ER. I did still sing my solo, but I had to do so from a wheelchair. And that was a really defining moment in my young life. I felt even more out of step with my classmates, and I wondered how I was ever going to get away from this disease. Shortly after I dropped out of high school and I dropped into community college, I was excited because I promised myself that this is my chance to reinvent myself, to be a new me, a Bethany without CMT. There was only one problem with that plan, which is that I do have CMT. And my fantasy lasted about a week until I found myself at college right in front of this lovely building here on the ground after being taken down by a handicap automated door that was moving a little bit faster than I was. So I'm on the ground, and I look up to see a campus police officer shouting loudly into his walkie-talkie, we have a girl down, a girl down, I need backup, backup. Within five minutes, backup did arrive. Two more security guards speeding up in their vehicles, lights flashing. These guys clearly had nothing better to do on a Sunday. And declaring that they had been dispatched and the situation is now under control and the girl is now on her feet and doing okay, very loudly just in case anyone on campus hadn't yet heard. <laughs> this was a dark time. And I started to wonder if this was what my life was going to be like. Would I ever be able to escape this disease? Or would my life forever be defined by it? It's an interesting 
notion being defined by a disease. And I thought, surely I am not the only person in history who has ever faced this conundrum. I want to play a bit of a game with you, and I want in your head for you to try to think about who I'm talking about. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at three different people from different perspectives and see what defines them. At 39 years, I suddenly fell ill. I developed ascending and severe paralysis throughout my whole body, including facial paralysis. I had bladder and bowel dysfunction for weeks, numbness everywhere. Over time, I had some recovery from the paralysis, which was descending slowly down my body. But I remained permanently paralyzed from the waist down. Family and friends secretly believed I should retire, that my career was over, and that I should resign myself to a sedentary life. Let's look at this person from another view. I attended Harbor College. I graduated from Columbia Law School. I got married and I fathered six children. After my illness, I became governor of the state of New York, then president of the United States. My fireside chats and policies brought hope and relief to millions during the Great Depression. I was elected president four times, even though I was paralyzed. I helped save the Western world from the rule of brutal tyrants and mass murderers from Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. At the time of my death, I was one of the most powerful and one of the most loved men in human history. My name is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and my disease did not define me. Let's look at another person. In college, I began to fall a lot. I was diagnosed with a serious motor neuron disease related to ALS. I was told I would probably die before I turned 21. The disease has progressed seriously over the years. I can no longer walk on my own, talk on my own, or always breathe on my own. I am almost entirely paralyzed and unable to care for myself. I am a theoretical physicist and cosmologist. I created gravitational singularity theorems and the framework of general relativity. This is really impressive, by the way. <laughs> I developed theoretical predictions that black holes emit radiation. I set forth a cosmology explained by a union of the general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. I received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. My first book sold over 9 million copies, not bad. I have acted in TV shows, been married twice, and have three children. I am considered one of the smartest men alive, a distinction I don't take too seriously. I'm now 71 years old and I've lived over 50 years longer than my doctors predicted. My name is Stephen Hawking, and my disease does not define me. At age 12, I was diagnosed with a progressive neurological condition. I was told to expect my first surgery by age 14. By age 18, I was in a wheelchair. My feet had become contorted, and even standing was painful. I have undergone extensive and painful surgeries to rebuild my feet. Now the disease is attacking my hands. I never graduated high school, yet this year I will graduate from UC Berkeley. I study nutritional science and metabolic biology. I work as an internet marketing consultant. I have wonderful friends and family who love me, and I have a boyfriend who is willing to push me up the hills in a wheelchair and who helps me to laugh at myself. I volunteer and fundraise to help eradicate my disease. I have extensive plans and hopes and dreams for a full life. My name is Bethany Noel Malosh, and my disease does not define me. This has become my first rule for living with CMT. My rules are there to help me to always keep striving to move forward, even if sometimes I have to tumble forward. 
I have always dreamed big. At five, my dream was to be a princess. But by 17, I had downgraded it to be a neuroscientist. <laughs> I know, kind of a letdown. And I found an amazing college that basically promised that if you could get through their pre-med program, they would get you into med school. I went to this beautiful, magical place in the fall of 2009 in the snowy hills of Pennsylvania. I felt unstoppable. CMT was no longer hindering my path. Did I mention that it was in the snowy hills of Pennsylvania? If this seems like a bad idea to you, then you are a lot smarter than I was at 17. <laughs> I progressed really rapidly over my first year at Juniata College. By the end of the year, I could not go nearly anywhere without the use of a wheelchair. I could not walk without pain, and even standing was difficult. I would have to decide between going to dinner at night and being able to make it to class the next day. I was hurting, and I was tired, and I was struggling just to get through each day. Over the summer, I decided to go see a surgeon for a consult and see what we could do about this. He told me that to fix my little problem, it would take 20 procedures on my feet. And I thought, this guy is crazy. So I went for a second opinion. And unfortunately, I didn't like it very much, because he said the same thing that the first guy did. He also said some other things which were even more terrifying, such as, first, I'm going to break your big toe. He used the word destroy in relation to my feet, which is never good to hear. The word oscillating saw was thrown around once or twice. <laughs> but the worst thing that he said was take time off from school and do this now. And this was not going to happen in any universe because CMT was not going to change my life plan. So I dismissed the surgeon. Sorry, surgeons in the audience. And I decided to return back to Juniata. But two weeks before, I was struggling so much just to go down a step. And my ankles were turning, and I was in tears, and I realized that I can't do this anymore. And so I decided to take time off from school and have the surgeries. This is me preparing to get the first foot done. This is the culprit who would be cutting into me shortly. Now, I warn you, if you're a little bit squeamish, you may want to close your eyes for the next picture. Um, but I think they're beautiful, so I have to include them. These are the feet immediately after the procedures in the operating room. Very cool surgeon who took these for me. Recovery was long. But our wonderful surgeon who spoke today mentioned that people are so excited when they first see their feet, and that is so true for me, because it was the most beautiful foot I'd ever seen, even though it looked like Frankenfoot. <laughs> and these pictures sort of show the difference. This is my right foot, which hadn't been done yet, and the left one had looked like the right. This is another view from the back, and you can see why it was a little bit hard to stand on these things. I learned an important rule through this experience, which is that sometimes I need to be willing to change my path. I thought that it was noble to deny my CMT and to pretend like it was never going to have any impact in my life. But I've come to look at it a little bit differently. I accept that I have CMT. No, I, I accept myself. Because don't get me wrong, I still have a love-hate relationship with CMT without the love. <laughs> but I have to remind myself that I have it, and sometimes it is going to impact my life, but it is not going to change 
who I am, and sometimes your new path ends up being better than the one you had originally imagined. I moved to sunny California. I was promised no snow, and so far it's held up to that. I never did end up going to Juniata College again. Snowy mountains were just not in my future. But sometimes the new path is better than the one you had previously imagined. When I came to California, I had to apply to colleges again. And in the University of California system, they let you apply sort of in mass. And Berkeley was a pipe dream, but it was another box that, I, box that I could check, so I thought, why not? And in my essay, I had kind of a lot of explaining to do, because here I am, I'm a high school dropout, I am a college dropout, and I have no standardized tests. Clearly, you should let me into your school. <laughs> but in the essay, I decided not to hide my CMT, because for better or for worse, CMT has had a huge impact in my life, and so I featured it. I featured it in how it has gotten me to the place I am now, the stronger place, and even a better place. One by one, I started getting rejection letters for most of my top picks for college, and I was devastated. The only school I hadn't heard back from was Berkeley, and I decided I wasn't even going to ex check my admission status to Berkeley, because if I couldn't get in anywhere else, I wasn't going to get into Berkeley. I was sobbing to anyone who would listen, about how I was never going to have a future, I was never going to graduate, I was never going to do anything worth value. And my boyfriend was being incredibly annoying by telling me that I needed to check my admission status. Like, really annoying. Uh, and I checked just two days before the deadline to accept, and I saw, congratulations, you have been accepted to UC Berkeley. Sometimes you have to learn to believe in the future, even when it's hard and even when things don't seem so right. And when you can't, sometimes other people have to believe in it for you. But let's face it, sometimes the future and even the present can be really scary. And this is maybe my least favorite rule because it's really hard, uh, which is facing my fears. My first class at Berkeley was a writing class, and the teacher gave us an assignment, which was to write about something that really scares us. So in class, we have our papers, and she asks us to read them aloud, and the first two students go, and they talk about their fear of heights. All right, okay, whatever. So I go, and I talk about how terrifying it is to walk across the street every day just to get to class about how scared I am that I'm going to fall. And this is a really like, legitimate possibility, which you guys might understand. And I worry about what the other pedestrians are thinking, what the people in the cars are thinking. Are they saying, why is she going so slow? Hurry up. Why is she walking this way? These are the sort of irrational thoughts that clouded me. This was my fear. And at the end of my reading of my paper, there was silence until one of the students, a jock who was attending Berkeley on a sports scholarship, looked at me with tears in his eyes, and he said, we are all in awe of you. And it wasn't until that moment that I realized the significance of something that I do every day which is just walking out that door and crossing that street. No one else opted to read their papers, by the way. <laughs> A 
Another fear I have is my disability being on display and what people are thinking and how that might impact what they think of who I am as a person. One of the ways that I've had to force myself to get over this is by showing off my braces. Here's one of my beautiful pairs right there. Very attractive. Um, and one day I was wearing my braces, walking up this incredibly large hill on the way to class, and it was about a mile long walk. And I don't have a picture of the hill, but it looked something like this. <laughs> And I was exhausted, and I was struggling, and you know, my base braces are bare, and I'm just hobbling up this hill. And I see these two guys ahead of me, and they're sitting on the side, and they're watching me. And my mind starts being clouded with these really negative thoughts again, like, what are they thinking? Are they judging me? Are they wondering what's wrong? And as I approach them, one of them shouts, it, shouts at me, you can do it. I'm like, thanks. And he says, I love you, sister. This is Berkeley, remember? <laughs> and I'm like, I love you, too. And I got up that hill, and I felt stronger. Our fears isolate us, and they can keep us from tumbling forward. And sometimes the hardest part is sharing your fears with others. But when you do, they can unite you. The best way to face fears is by challenging yourself to do new and difficult things. And a couple weeks before I was to give this talk, I asked in our CMT athletes group on Facebook, which is great, by the way, you guys should join, for some exercise advice. But I said, no exercises on the floor. I'm not getting on the floor. Not for anyone, because I know that I can't get off the floor. And one member, who actually may be in the audience, said, maybe that's a sign that you should be getting on the floor and doing exercises on the floor. And I was like, excuse me, I have a disability here. I was indignant. This is ridiculous, until I realized that I was being an incredible hypocrite with this talk. And I made myself get on that floor. And on the way down, I thought, Bethany, you are such an idiot. They're going to find your cold, dead body here. <laughs> but I did get up off the floor, and it felt pretty good. <laughs> Tumbling forward is an art. It's not a science. And I don't always follow my rules very well. But when I do, incredible things can happen. And this next story is an example of that. After my surgeries, I started seeing how far I could push myself physically. And I had this goal to see how far I could walk. One mile, three miles, five miles. And I decided to set a seven mile goal. And I wanted to raise money for the CMTA at the same time. Because I thought, maybe one day I can run. I had a really small vision for this walk at first. I thought that it would probably just be me and my poor boyfriend walking seven miles. I always sign him up for these things. Uh, and then I told Elizabeth about it. And suddenly, it took on a new form. And our amazing support group in the San Francisco Bay Area got involved and got excited for me and this event. I was training really hard for this walk when I was crossing the street one day and someone tripped me from behind. And I fell really badly, bleeding in the street, the whole shebang. So naturally, I posted on Facebook after and I actually did get some more money for this photo. So the fall was a success in some ways. I was able to still do the walk. And it was so incredible to see how this organization can bring people together. There were over 50 to 60 people in attendance. There were shirts, which I didn't know about. 
There was cake. Our Dr. Day from the Stanford Clinic and Carly Siskind even came out to walk with me and to support me. At the end of my seven miles, my mom placed a medal over my head. I won a medal. It's really cool. That's my boyfriend, by the way, on the bottom. He walked the whole seven. I'm really proud of him. Uh, and we even made the news. We were in the Mountain View Voice, the San Jose Mercury Times, and the UC Berkeley student paper. I had this small vision, and with this community and with all of you, many of you in the audience, this became something so much bigger and one of the most incredible moments in my life. We raised over $9,652 for the CMTA. I know that CMT is a progressive disease, and I don't know where I will be in the future. But I walk because I can. And I walk for my dad, who has CMT, and I walk for my grandmother, who had CMT, and would have been so proud of her baby. And I walk for the hundreds of you that I have met. This fall, I will be attempting to walk a half marathon, which is 13.1 miles. And I hope that I might get the opportunity to see some of you there. I have learned in my journey of tumbling forward to accept myself, to believe in my future, to face my fears, to challenge myself. And when I do, I do move forward. No matter what happens with me or with CMT, I want to open myself up to what adventures lay after me. It isn't always easy, and sometimes I do fall, literally and figuratively, but I always will get up and I will keep going. Sometimes CMT changes your path, but sometimes the new path is better than the one you had originally imagined. My name is Bethany Noel Malosh, and my disease does not define me. Thank you.